Hey, welcome to Planet Hex. I'm Andrew Horn. This is a show where I talk about a lot of retro culture, a lot of movies, VHS tapes, games, comics, music, the writing life, and a bunch of other things that scratch the itch. And tonight I'm going to talk about how certain movies should be appreciated not just at Halloween but throughout the year. So yes, this is a reminder that some cult films, genre films, cult classics, they're not just for Halloween. They are for always. The first one we're going to bring up tonight is A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original, the classic. Not my favourite from the series, that will always be Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, where it all kind of gelled together. But A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original one, introduced the world to Freddy Krueger, introduced Robert Englund to a wider audience, and indeed Wes Craven to a wider audience. They'd, they'd both been doing stuff before this, but this is the one that really cemented everything uh, for them. And it also brought Johnny Depp to a lot of uh, a lot of people's awareness as well through his performance. Um, and... Um, you know, as a geyser of mush. Um, this is, I brought this one up because this is, it's hard to explain. The way that this introduces the idea of Freddy, the dreams, uh, how the dreams can interfere with the real world and so on, hadn't been done on this scale before, uh, especially not with a character as enigmatic as Freddy Krueger. Yeah, he is a you know a child murdering demonic psychopath that lives in a dream realm, but the way he was put forward in this movie was frightening. In the first two, that's when Freddy was still frightening, and was still dark and really brutal. Once it got to Dream Warriors and beyond, we got all the we got more comedy, we got more um, you know quips and things like that. But this is the movie that started it all. Sorry, I should move the Evercade. Um, this is the movie that started it all and brought him to consciousness. The glove and the the iconic opening title sequence where he's you know making the glove and it's just so so cool. So definitely check out the immortal, the classic, and Nightmare on Elm Street. The next one I'm going to talk about it's got to be The Crow. Brandon Lee in The Crow was a game changer. Yeah, if you if you don't know the story, Brandon Lee, the son of Bruce Lee, died while making The Crow when um, there was a terrible accident involving a prop gun that wasn't entirely loaded with blanks, uh, and he did die from his injuries from that accident. Uh, the film was completed with some um, like early CGI. CGI was still in its rather in its infancy back then. Uh, body doubles, trick photography, and reusing some footage. It was beautifully finished, directed by Alex Proyas. Um, and it is it stands it stands up nowadays even with some dated effects and um you know like just the overall look of it has aged somewhat it stands up as a fantastic piece of genre cinema that still has an impact to this day and yeah there were sequels there's the parent eminent remake which is just heresy this is one film that should not be remade sequels spin-offs you know and you take on it that's that's fine especially if you adapted the uh, the crow novel clash by night which was a really good novel i remember that one um but eric draven's story should be left alone as brandon lee was definitive in this it was excellent and not just because of what happened to him although that did bring a lot of attention to this movie he was just fantastic in it all round fantastic so do check out the crow um throughout the year not just at halloween even though it is set on you know devil's night do check out the crow an absolute must see and a must have in any collection on any format enjoy it um yep yeah, bit more tongue in cheek this one is going to be elvira mistress of the dark i'm a huge fan of elvira i'm a huge fan of the the kitsch humor the look of the character the the tongue in cheek nature of the jokes and you know it's very self aware. Elvira is a very self aware character long before things became so self referential and meta. So I think Elvira is a great early example of that. Her feature film debut uh, from I think it was eighty eight. Um, it mixed raucous eighties comedy with lots of like carry on film style humour and a bit of a an eighty style horror uh, element in there as well. And it's just fun. This movie is fun. It's like there is. While attitudes have changed since this came out, the jokes in this are so tongue in cheek and so, you know, like dad joke level, it's a sub dad joke level, um, that the rude humour, um, it comes across more pantomime than 
kind of misogynistic. Um, that's my personal experience with this. That's how it comes across because Elvira is very much in on the joke. But I've always loved this character. I loved this movie when I saw it as a teenager. Of course I did. And I just think Elvira is fantastic. Do recommend, definitely recommend her autobiography, Crawley Yours, which is just brilliant. A fantastic book. Real eye-opener uh, to the uh, the genesis of the character, but also the life of Cassandra Peterson, who plays Elvira. Absolutely great fun. This is a superb recommendation. Next one I would say, next one I'm going to recommend is Night of the Comet. Now, I keep meaning to do something longer about Night of the Comet because it's um, it's an interesting one. This cover's actually from the beta, uh, sorry, the Betamax tape. Uh, I have this on DVD. I had not, I've never had this on tape, but I've seen it. I have, um, I've rented it on tape before and seen it on various, uh, various formats since then. And it's a wonderful, wonderfully odd mix of horror, 80s sci-fi, 80s drama, and a bit of like a teen coming of age story. It's a really odd mix, but it works. Terrible thing has happened. Most of the most of the uh, planetary um, population has disappeared overnight, leaving just a small group of people to try and rebuild society. But there's zombies along the way. There's all kinds of like fallout from the uh, from the event, and it's an interesting look at what you would get up to if suddenly you were the only people there. You know, like in Twenty Eight Days Later, where they go shopping in the supermarket and uh, he puts the credit card on the counter, that sort of thing. What would you do in that situation? And that's the exact sort of thing you would do in that situation. So, the next one I'm going to talk about is Reanimator. You can't have Halloween without Reanimator, in my in my opinion. But it is a film that pays for the rewatch no matter the time of year. The story of Herbert West bringing things back to life with his green goo, with Jeffrey Combs just being brilliant in it. It never dates, it never ages. Um, again, it is very tongue-in-cheek. Um, Stuart Gordon did an amazing job bringing this to life. The cast are great, the practical effects are superb, and there are some real gross-out moments of just horror as well as very, very silly comedy. And part of the things that is really endearing about Herbert West, he's so, he's so serious and so focused on his work that... A lot of the jokes go over his head, and that just makes them funnier. So definitely, definitely, Reanimator is definitely on my list of films that are for life and not just for Christmas. Next, I'm going to say Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. I have just been recently been on a podcast talking about this um, on the Silver Screen uh, podcast, cult classic series they're doing. I was asked to go on and talk about Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, because it is my favourite from the series. Yeah, I know that's sacrilege to some, but... I think what they did with this, going back to the original intent for the Halloween series, which was an, as, an, as an anthology, uh, rather than just movies about Michael Myers, um, I think this was a really nice um, segue into something weirder. And it has this mix of horror, and it has this mix of sci-fi, and this unnerving Twilight Zone, x file sort of feel to it, um, that's um, also brought to my phantasm. Um, I'll put a link to the the podcast down below because it's it's a good it's a good lesson where we discuss um, Halloween three and its importance to the genre and why it's it shouldn't be seen as the black sheep it shouldn't be seen as the odd one out in the series of Halloween movies um, and it's just a great idea executed relatively well but it's an endearing endearing watch great for Halloween but great throughout the year. Next up, I have to mention Return of the Living Dead. Ah. <sighs> Lydia Quigley as a as a punk, one of the punks in this, just one of the greatest things you'll ever see. And I am really looking forward to um, on the at the end of this month, night before Halloween, on the thirtieth, I'll be going to see a late night screening of this um, with the uh, with straight to video guys and so on. And this is so cool. It's anarchic. It's ridiculous. Its tongue is firmly planted in its cheek. And this is one of my go to feel good movies. Return of the Living Dead is just out and out fun you get tar man going burns you get all the zombies you get the ridiculous humor the over-the-top performances and i just adore it if you're not familiar with this this is um sort of a spin-off from the original night of the living dead because i think it was i remember it was uh, written by john russo wasn't it um so this is sort of linked to night of the living dead the the, the genesis of the zombie genre as we know it um but it's just like not the living dead but if it was made by trauma 
I mean that in the best possible way because I love both of those things. But this is an absolute must watch. If you've never seen it, I wholeheartedly recommend it. Next up, I'm on that on that note, further on in the Secret series, yeah, there was Return of the Living Dead 2, which was sort of a comedy, um, horror comedy in the vein of the first one. Nowhere near as anarchic or as iconic, but still fun to watch. But Return of the Living Dead 3 did something new that hadn't been that I hadn't seen in the zombie genre before. Um, as you see the lady on the cover there, she's got spikes through it, she's got um, claws and she's got glass through her and the spikes through her face and all kinds of things. So immediately as soon as you see that cover it's like what the hell's going on here? And the most of the movie is about her trying to stay human. And the only we when she's been bitten by a, a zombie, spoiler alert, but it's from 1993, you should have seen it by now. Um, once she's been bitten, bitten by a zombie, she starts turning into one, but she's found that if she causes herself pain, uh, then she can retain some of her humanity. And the battle that she goes through in this film is really cool. It's a really good watch. Yeah, watching it now, especially if you see it on like a 4K TV or anything, it's it doesn't look brilliant. But the story is great, and if you're okay with watching genre cinema from previous generations, you'd be fine with this. Great movie, great watch. Wholeheartedly recommended this. So I'm going to go creepy. I'm going to go creepy and bring up dolls. Now, the killer doll genre, everyone knows about Chucky. Not a big fan of Chucky for many reasons. Um, mainly because I used to sell a lot of Chucky dolls in the comic shop days when I used to work in a comic shop and those things were the bane of our lives. Uh, so they were forever breaking because parents that weren't really clued up on what they were kept buying them for small children and they would just get ripped apart. They are not appropriate for kids. They are they were collector's items, you know, and that's what it said on the boxes. And um, it just it just completely turned me off Chucky for life. So I heard, oh, my Ch Chucky dolls so much. And you just knew how the conversation was going to go. It was going to try and explain that it's not intended for kids. And then they would say, but it's a doll. And they said, but no, it's, it's intended to look like a film prop. But oh, no, but it's a doll. They can play with it. And then they bring it back and it's damaged. And you say, well, you you know, we did say. Anyway, dolls. This was, um, I think it was an Empire movie. Um, I think it was an Empire movie. Let me have a look at the cover there. Yeah, it's Empire Pictures. Getting my Empire stuff mixed up, this will not do. So Charles Band was involved with this, the Full Moon guy who's one of my heroes, movie-wise. Um, and this was a really, really creepy entry into the possessed killer dolls genre. Um, as you can see from the cover there, the um, the dolls look weird anyway. They they looked weird straight away, they looked strange. But um, what was really set this apart from a lot of the other possessed doll movies that you may see was that when these dolls were destroyed, when one was like smashed, you could see a tiny skeleton inside, a tiny wet, bloody skeleton inside these inside these like porcelain dolls, and that just made it so weird uh, and really unnerving. Uh, it's a relatively small scale movie that takes place largely in one location, and that makes it claustrophobic as well. And it's just a really cool watch. Uh, if you've never seen this, but you you're up on things like Child's Play. Puppet Master, demonic toys, that sort of thing. Or you want to see where the origins of where things like Annabelle um, clearly took some nods from. Check out Dolls. It's really worth your time. The last one I'm going to talk about tonight is one I've just rewatched this week. It's Jason Lives. Friday the 13th, Part 6. Uh, it's one where it's my favourite of the series. It's one where every, all the elements of a, a Jason movie fell into place. And it is the start of the zombie Jason period, which was Jason Lives, part six, part seven, New Blood, part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan, and Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday, and eventually Jason X uh, several years later. But this was, this was where that zombie Jason era began. Uh, where he gets struck by light his corpse, gets struck by lightning, uh, with the with the fence with the metal fence post in him, gets struck by lightning, comes back as zombie chase, and there's maggots falling off him and everything, and carries on his killing spree. In this, things have moved on. Camp Crystal Lake is no longer Camp Crystal Lake; it has a different name, and kids are going back there. So of course, Jason goes back to where it all began, back to Camp Crystal Lake. It also has Tommy Jarvis in it as a grown up. I saw him as a kid in uh, part five, um, but um, yeah, this is a really cool entry. This is the fun. 
this is the sort of fun Saturday night viewing that I could watch any time of the year. I say not just for Halloween. This is an all-round, all-round, all-year-round piece of entertainment. It's got the kills, it's got the camp counsellors, it's got the kids doing things they probably shouldn't uh, when they're out at camp. And it's got the theme tunes by, it's got the songs by Alice Cooper on there, the man behind the mask and so on. That even has the Jason ch 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 uh, noise in it. This is everything you could want from a Friday the 13th movie and I, I never get tired of it. This is the first one I saw, the first one I bought uh, and first one I owned and I got it from our price. I got it from our price on VHS. It was $9.99. It was worth every damn penny. It still has a lot of entertainment value. A lot of the kills in it are still grotesque. The, the gore in it is impressive. And uh, it doesn't hang around long. It's got a good pacing. It's got some nice jokes, some nice nods to the earlier movies. But yeah, it's a new Jason. It's the zombie Jason era. And that's been well and truly begun with, with Friday the 13th Part 6. So that is a selection of movies that are for life. And not just for Halloween. Gather them, check them out, enjoy them. But you don't have to limit watching scary movies just in one part of the year. I know I don't, I watch them all the time. And I feel I, I get a lot out of that. I get a lot out of the genre as a whole. Yeah, it's heightened right now at Halloween, um, but you know, why can't we enjoy scary things right throughout the year? It's good to be excited, it's good to be a little bit frightened and then see the bad guys get the comeuppance. Or not, as is the case with many horror movies. So check these movies out and enjoy them throughout the year. I'm Andrew Horn. please do like and subscribe if you like this sort of thing. Um, if you like the stuff I talk about, please do check out my book, VHS Ain't My Brain, Revised Edition. I've got to plug it, haven't I? You know, um, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and do hit like and subscribe if you so want to. I'm not going to be that YouTube guy that says hit notifications. Make sure your bell is on. Because then your phone fills up with notifications and everything goes mad. So don't do that. Don't do that. Just check back regularly. Because there's always something new here on Planet Hex. So thank you for watching this episode. And I'll check you, catch you again for the next one. You know, I always wonder about the end of these videos where I do the smile. And I just wonder how long I should hold it. Um, but I'm never quite sure. But anyway, thanks for watching.